Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Lisa Ramsey, Professor of Law at the University of San Diego School of Law. We will discuss her article, Free Speech Challenges to Trademark Law After Mittal v. Tam, which was published in the Houston Law Review, and her work on non-traditional trademarks. So welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, the pleasure's all mine. I um, thought this is a really cool and obviously very timely paper, and also like a really nice look at the landscape of what trademark law and trademark doctrine looks like today. So, so I was wondering if you could start by talking a little bit kind of really basically about about trademark law. So like, you know, what is a, a trademark and what kinds of things can be a trademark? Sure, I can talk about that. So a trademark uh, can be a word, a name, uh, a symbol, like a logo, a product feature, um, any of those things that can be used to identify and distinguish the source of goods and services. So uh, for example, Coca-Cola is a trademark for a soft drink. And uh, Coca-Cola Company also uses a number of other trademarks, right? They have a number of slogans they've used uh, over the years. Uh, Taste of Feeling, I think, is one of their mm, most recent mm. slogans. Um, uh, they also own uh, trademark rights in the shape of their distinctive bottle design. And in the distinctive product packaging, the red and white product packaging you see on the Coca-Cola cans and the labels of the Coca-Cola bottles. <clears throat> right. So essentially, how do we distinguish between the kinds of things that are or can be a trademark and the aspects of a product or the aspects of a company's sort of presence in the marketplace that wouldn't be a trademark? Well, so it used to be that trademarks primarily consisted of words and logos and product packaging designs. But after a case called Qualitex, uh, where the, uh, the Supreme Court looked at the statutory language, which said that you can register a word, a name, a symbol or device, uh, the court said that the words symbol and device are, are actually uh, pretty broad. And uh, as long as the thing that you're trying to register can convey source distinguishing meaning, it can act as a trademark. And so in that case, a company was trying to register the color green gold for dry cleaning press pads. And uh, the court said, sure, single colors can be registered as trademarks if consumers can use that color to distinguish the product source. Um, so, you know, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, right, you can tell the difference because of the names of the companies, but also the product packaging um, that they use might, might signal when you walk into the store and grab that drink at who it is that's providing that particular product. Um, but so, so in the Qualtex case, the court said that, you know, a fragrance, um, the example they used uh, would be um, the smell of plumeria blossoms on sewing thread, uh, which at the time was a registered trademark. Um, and then also the sound, sounds can be registered, NBC's three chimes. Um, today, also textures can be registered. An example is leather uh, around, wrapped around the bottle of wine um, is a trademark uh, that's registered by the David uh, family group. So pretty much almost anything that can convey source distinguishing meaning can qualify as a trademark today. Interesting. So you've been talking about registration. What's what's the relationship between trademarks and registration? In other words, you know, what does registration mean? Where does it happen? And what effect does it have on, on a trademark? So trademarks can exist uh, without registration at all. Uh, in the United States, you can get common law trademark protection as long as you're using a trademark in commerce, right, in connection with the sale of goods and services. Um, registration provides valuable benefits. Um, it provides notice to other people that you are basically claiming dibs in this particular word or product feature. Um, but it also gives you a presumption uh, of validity uh, and of ownership in that particular trademark. And so um, it's one reason that trademark attorneys encourage clients to register their trademarks, uh, because then you're letting the world know you own rights to it. And also it makes it easier to get trademark rights in foreign countries if you have a registration in the United States. Mm. So your your paper on Metal v. Tam is sort of tracking a real shift in or like an important shift in the way we think about 
about registration, but but what what did it used to be like? So, sort of historically, how did the government, the trademark office, regulate the registration of of trademarks? So there are definitely certain types of marks that that you were not able to register, even if they they were source distinguishing. Um, so the the Congress uh, passed a statute prohibiting the registration of marks that may disparage persons and institutions and groups, um, uh, marks that are immoral and scandalous. Um, so those are the provisions that have been issued. Uh, Tam case and dealt with the disparaging trademarks, and more recently Brunetti dealt with the immoral and scandalous mark provision. Um, but there are also other uh, provisions uh, that have rules uh, regulating registration of trademarks. So, for example, you can't register a flag or a government symbol um, because of a, a rule that we have in the Lanham Act, which is the federal trademark statute. Uh, you can't register marks that are likely to cause confusion with previously registered marks. Uh, you can't register generic terms, right? The word uh, computer uh, is generic for computers. Um, so you can register more distinctive terms like Apple for computers. Um, but you, but uh, if, and, you, and you can also register descriptive terms if they have become distinctive. Uh, so if people actually associate that word with your company, an example would be American Airlines. Um, so, you know, so, so what will happen is, a lot of times people will be using a trademark and not get a registration. They can still sue somebody for infringement and even dilution of that trademark without a registration, but they want to get that registration to get those presumptions of validity and ownership. Um, and sometimes too, it can provide you with additional uh, benefits. You can, for example, block people from uh, importing products that have your registered trademark. Um, so, so this is why people apply to register these marks. Uh, but what was happening uh, in the Brunetti case and in the Tam case is that, is that uh, people tried to register disparaging terms, profanity, and the PTO rejected those applications. So historically, what was the sort of conception as to why rejection of those kinds of registrations was um, was acceptable. In other words, you know, what was the sort of justification for these exclusions? And and if you can, if if you don't mind, like talk a little bit about sort of what specifically Metal V Tam and Yanku V Brunetti were about and sort of how that historical understanding might have changed. Oh, sure. Uh, so the the provision banning registration of scandalous and immoral trademarks is actually pretty old. It was enacted back in 1905. And um, a number of nations have laws that uh, regulate the registration of immoral trademarks. Uh, they, they often use different language. Uh, some say scandalous. Um, I believe that, uh, back in the UK, their provision had the word scandalous in it. And so you see scandalous in, um, in a number of, of other countries' uh, laws, that, that Commonwealth countries. Um, but, um, but a number of other nations just ban registration of marks that are immoral or against public policy. And one reason is we have an international treaty, um, the um, Paris Convention, which enables members of the Paris Union to deny registration to marks that are, are immoral or against public policy. And so, uh, you know, might be a number of reasons you don't want to register a mark. Perhaps it is, um, Offensive to to, to religion to, to a particular religion, uh, for example, in one country, uh, they did refuse to allow registration of the word Jesus uh, for jeans. I believe um, it might be a, a trademark consisting of profanity or an obscene image, right, of uh, some sort of sexual image. Um, and, and different nations um, have different uh, things that they're worried about. You know, you maybe you're a, a, a nation that doesn't like communism, right? So you might not want to allow registration of communist symbols things like that. So, or um, maybe something that, that promotes terrorism. Um, so, so, you know, so it's for reasons of morality that, that people mm. thought the government can decide what can and cannot be registered. Um, the disparaging mark provision is a little bit more recent. Um, I think that was sometime maybe around 1946 uh, when the Lanham Act was enacted, the, again, the federal trademark law. And, um, and it been basically it was banning registration of hate speech. And so in the Tam case, um, there was an Asian American rock band called the Slants and Simon Tam, uh, one of the members of the band applied to register the Slants as a mark, uh, for the entertainment services of his rock band. And that the group was trying to reclaim this term that had been used as a slur, uh, against Asians or Asian Americans. And, um, and the mark was rejected uh, by the PTO, um, and it went up on appeal in, in, in the federal circuit. 
at first they, they said that it was fine. They, the PTO can register. So I can refuse to register these terms because the PTO is not suppressing their speech. They can still use the term, the slants as a, as a name of their band. Um, but, uh, but then later on, uh, Judge Moore wrote a, a, a kind of a separate opinion saying, wait a second, this, this, I think this might uh, violate the right to freedom of expression and the First Amendment. And so the entire federal circuit uh, took up this case and, and actually reversed the PTO's decision and said the provision banning registration of marks which may disparage is a violation of the First Amendment uh, because it discriminates based on viewpoint. Uh, in other words, the PTO is registering words that are uh, beneficial uh, or, or promote Asians, right, uh, celebrations, for example, but denying registrations of terms like the slants. Um, and at the time, uh, there was a controversy about the Redskins trademark uh, for the football, you know, football team. And some people, some cynics say, well, if, if the Redskins case had gone up instead of Tam, you know, might there be a different result? Uh, because they, they were not, you know, uh, it was not the group, you know, they were, were trying to reclaim the term, you know, mm -hmm. as their own, right? This was a, a, a term that was uh, disparaging towards Native Americans. And, um, but the TAM case was the one that went up and uh, eight members of the court uh, held that this was a viewpoint discriminatory law and struck it down. It's the first time the First Amendment was applied to trademark law. So it's a very big deal for people like myself who have been arguing that that trademark laws regulate expression and that we should consider whether these laws are constitutional. Right, right. And so then just very recently, the Yanku v. Brunetti case addressed the scandalous Mark um, question as well. It was my impression that it was sort of like not a surprise the way that Yanku v. Brunetti came out. That's correct. So, so I'll give you some background about that case. So, in the Brunetti case, Eric Brunetti, uh, back in the 1990s, started using um, a brand name. Uh, it was F U C T, which he claims uh, stood for Friends You Can't Trust. Other people <laughs> thought that this uh, term actually uh, was really just the word fucked. And so, um, so as a result, when he applied to register the trademark, it was denied by the Patent Trademark Office on the two grounds that it was immoral and scandalous. And traditionally, the court, I'm sorry, the, the PTO has treated those words to be synonymous. Um, and so if, if, if you're violating one, you're violating the other. Um, in the Bonetti decision, the court actually distinguishes between the two, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so yeah, so he had applied to register um, this phrase that kept on getting denied by the PTO. Um, and then TAM comes down, and everybody said, well, if, if the disparaging mark provision is going down, it's very likely the immoral and scandalous mark provision might go down. But some people said, well, wait a second, uh, the disparaging term provision was viewpoint discriminatory, you know, is a law banning registration of profanity, you know, uh, sexual images, is that viewpoint discriminatory or just content discriminatory? Um, and so that, that's why some people weren't totally sure if the court would do the same thing. Um, other people said, look, if they're going to allow registration of racist speech, right, you know, let's hope that they're also going to allow registration of profanity because that kind of looks bad. So um, so I think the I, I personally thought that they were probably follow Tam and find this provision to be a viewpoint discriminatory law. And in the case, uh, the, ma the, the, the majority opinion was written by Justice Kagan. Um, she did say that that laws banning registration of profanity do regulate regulate viewpoint uh, on mm. the basis of viewpoint. And so um, they struck down this law and, and the government basically conceded if, if it was a viewpoint discriminatory law, then, then it would fail. Um, so the court did not then engage with the this question of whether it had to satisfy some sort of constitutional balancing test, like strict scrutiny analysis. The court basically just said, you know, it, it, it's viewpoint discriminatory and therefore the law is unconstitutional. Right. So I actually was, I was rereading uh, Yanku v. Brunetti last night. I was struck by it being relatively brief and not all that detailed about the consequences. And one of the things that I found really fascinating about your paper is the way that you kind of take Mittal v. Tam and trace all of these other consequences that it doesn't feel like the court fully contemplated when it made that decision or the follow-on decision in Yanku v. Brunetti. Am, am I reading it correctly? You're, you're totally correct. So, so let me start with Tam. So some of the criticism of Tam is that there are a number of quotes in Tam where the court talks about the fact that, it, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, 
the First Amendment prevents the government from banning speech or suppressing speech. And myself and a number of other people said, look, the registration law is not banning anyone's speech. On the other, you know, to the contrary, what you do is when you grant someone a trademark registration, then they can use that registration and go to court and actually ban other people's speech, right? Or they can go to Amazon or uh, to, uh, you know, a print on demand company website and say, hey, I have a registration. You need to take down these other shirts that, that have my registered phrase on it. So uh, so that was one thing that frustrated a number of commentators uh, is, is that the court had all these quotes about laws banning or suppressing speech, um, but this was not what the law did. And so one of the nice things about Brunetti is that I think the justices finally figured out that, that actually this law is just a denying of benefit. It's a valuable benefit, but it's not actually suppressing speech. And so even in the majority opinion where they, they said the law was, was uh, unconstitutional, you don't see this language again about suppressing speech. Um, so, um, but, but what's interesting is both in TAM and in Brunetti, um, the court said, we're not talking about any other laws, right? So even in TAM, they didn't say, we're not talking about whether the immoral scandalous market provision is unconstitutional, right? And they didn't set forth any framework, uh, for how you evaluate the constitutionality of trademark laws in the future. And so same thing in Brunetti, they said this law was viewpoint discriminatory, but we're not talking about any other trademark laws. And in my work and, and the work of other people who write in this area, Rebecca Tushnet um, and, and others, um, you know, we've talked about the fact that you need to be thinking about, is this trademark law regulating commercial speech um, or also non-commercial speech? Mm -hmm. um, so dilution law only regulates commercial speech. Uh, dilution law is a law that um, bans use of a famous trademark um, in a manner that that harms the distinctiveness of that trademark. Uh, so if you're, for example, Victoria's Secret, right, a famous trademark, and some guy decides to open a shop selling sex toys under the trademark Victor's Secret, right, this is uh, going to uh, kind of harm the distinctiveness of the trademark. Um, but also uh, the law bans registration of, of uh, marks that might harm the reputation of, of the uh, trademark owner. So kind of a, it's called tarnishment. So either like blurring the blurring the, the distinctiveness of the term, I guess another example would be um, a guy tried to use e-visa for a site, a website where he helped you uh, learn how to uh, how, learn foreign languages uh, that was uh, found to blur the distinctiveness of the visa trademark. And then again, Victor's Secret was was deemed to be tarnishing of, of, Vic, of Victoria's Secret. Um, so for the dilution statute, the, it doesn't regulate non-commercial um, uses of trademarks. And so that's one way that current trademark laws protect freedom of expression in trademark law. But the infringement statute doesn't actually apply just to commercial speech on its face. Um, it does require use of the trademark in commerce um, in connection with goods and services, but a lot of companies provide you know, services for free. We, we have, uh, you know, political, uh, political services, religious services, uh, things like that. Um, so, um, so the, so that was one question that was not answered in Tam or in Brunetti as to whether trademark laws are just commercial speech regulations or if they regulate non-commercial speech. If it's commercial speech under current First Amendment law, um, it's an intermediate level of constitutional scrutiny, which you still, you know, it's not nothing, right? The court mm -hmm. has struck down a number of, uh, commercial speech regulations on the ground that they don't satisfy constitutional scrutiny, but it's a little bit easier to satisfy. Whereas if you're regulating non-commercial speech, it has to satisfy strict constitutional scrutiny. And, and that's often fatal, um, not always, but it usually is. And so, um, so the court decided we're not going to decide that issue. Um, and then the other issue is whether trademark laws are content-based uh, regulations of speech, uh, viewpoint-based Discrim uh, or discriminate viewpoint discriminatory regulations of speech, or if they're content neutral regulations. And so an example of a content neutral regulation would be a regulation of the time, place, or manner of expression. So the sound levels of concerts, right, is an example of the manner. Um, place might be, you know, you can regulate speech in schools, but not, you know, on a you know, in a public park, for example. Um, and myself and others, Eugene Volick, Mark Lemley, uh, have argued that trademark laws are definitely not content neutral regulations <laughs> because you actually have to look at the content of the word, right, to decide if it's infringing or diluting. Um, and also if you're deciding whether to register a trademark, right, uh, is it disparaging? Is it likely to cause confusion with another registration? Is it a flag, right? All of that's a content-based determination. Um, and so what the court said, obviously, for the scandalous and moral and disparaging mark provisions, it was not just content-based. It was discriminating based on your ideas or your viewpoint. 
Um, so, but so that was another important distinction. Um, and one of the good things, I guess, from my perspective is that nobody on the court said that these trademark laws are content neutral regulations of speech. So that means that, that either Central Hudson's commercial speech test of, for intermediate scrutiny, uh, uh, sorry, inter it, Central Hudson's intermediate scrutiny test applies, um, which says that you need to uh, uh, have the law directly and materially further a substantial government interest um, and uh, not harm speech more than necessary, right? Or if it's non-commercial speech or if it's viewpoint discriminatory, perhaps you need strict scrutiny analysis, mm -hmm. which means you have to have a law that's narrowly tailored to further a compelling government interest and be the least restrictive means of, of, uh, of regulating expression. So very hard to satisfy that test. Uh, so that's kind of a long, a long answer to yeah. your question. But, but those are the First Amendment doctrines where it, it's still not clear, uh, you know, if we apply one of those tests, or if we treat trademark laws um, like other uh, kinds of uh, regulations that are more similar, like um, um, the there's like the doctrine called the limited public forum, which I can talk about if you want, um, or uh, government subsidies, right? When we subsidize the art, where, where we do where we subsidize the arts, where we do allow some content discrimination, uh, but we don't allow viewpoint discrimination in those areas. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sonia, what, what didn't really strike me fully until I read your paper was just how profound a sort of sea change in thinking about First Amendment values in relation to trademark registration, Metal v. Tam, and by extension, Iancu v. Prunetti would be in the sense that it seems like previously registration was effectively a sort of ministerial act on the part of the government making decisions essentially about government speech. And now the court has said, no, that registration decision is actually itself a speech regulation. And that that First Amendment application seems like, in a sense, like it like cascades all the way through trademark law. That's correct. Uh, so a number of us, uh, you know, Rebecca Tishnet, uh, myself, uh, some uh, trademark attorneys have, have said, well, most most trademark laws are going to be constitutional after Tam and Brunetti, right? So laws that prohibit registration of marks that are likely to cause confusion with other marks, that's fine, right? Because the government can regulate misleading commercial speech. It can ban fraudulent speech. Um, so, so anything that kind of is focused on confusion, right, falsely suggesting a connection to other people, for example, or um, deceptively uh, misdescriptive words or deceptive words, all of those things still constitutional um, after the town case. Uh, the more interesting question is, well, what do we do about these other provisions that, um, that don't regulate confusing uses of trademarks, but are st we still, we want to uh, refuse to register these other kinds of marks for a number of reasons. And so I've argued that uh, one of the reasons that uh, one of the things we should be paying attention to is the fact that the trademark law wants to promote competition, right, prevent unfair competition. So we have provisions like the ban on registration of merely descriptive words or of functional product features, um, both of those regulations um, are pro-competitive. And so if you subjected them to intermediate scrutiny analysis, um, they would survive constitutional scrutiny analysis because the government interest, right, is in furthering uh, competition. And a law that bans registration of descriptive matter or of functional product attributes um, is going to directly and materially promote those interests and does not harm expression more than necessary because the whole point of the law is to allow other competitors to use these descriptive terms and these product features. So that law would survive constitutional scrutiny. Um, what I've argued, though, is, is that we also need to be thinking about whether registering trademarks is constitutional, right? Because when you allow registration of a descriptive term that has acquired distinctiveness or, or acquired what's called secondary meaning, meaning that people associate that term with your company, once we allow that registration, um, you can stop other people from using that phrase in connection with those goods and services, but also, um, with it, you can stop use of terms that are similar to your phrase. And if your mark becomes famous, can stop other people mm. from using that phrase in connection with other goods and services. 
So a concern that I have is once you get that registration, um, you can actually ban speech. So one example would be a romance author um, was using the word cocky in the title of her of her um, novels, right? So she was t- writing about cocky, a cocky senator, and it was called cocky senator or cocky firefighter, right? And at some point applied to register the phrase cocky for a series of romance novels and actually got that registration. Um, people have criticized that as being a descriptive term for romance novels that, that talk about cocky men, right? But what happened was she got this registration and then she sent a letter to other authors and said that your book, which has the word cocky in the title, um, is, is infringing my registered trademark. Um, and then also sent a complaint to Amazon and said, Amazon, you need to take down these listings for books that have the word cocky in the title. So Amazon took them down, right? So we have private censorship here. Um, That's not a First Amendment violation, right? There's no government action there. Um, But still, that's bad for for freedom of expression. Um, And then a number of authors um, actually changed the titles of their novels once they looked up her registration registration and saw that that it was valid. So um, the Amazon ultimately put put those books back. And uh, I know some other folks have, have challenged the registration of the term cocky. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of whether they were successful, but this is one of the problems with re- allowing registration of descriptive terms that, that you know, someone at the uh, trademark office has determined now have secondary meaning is because uh, you can use that registration as a weapon to stop other people from speaking. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit specifically about the differences between uh, what a plaintiff, a trademark plaintiff have to, has to prove in order to show infringement versus what they have to prove in order to show dilution. Because for me, that was a helpful illustration of why dilution kind of presents First Amendment free speech problems that maybe infringement doesn't present or at least presents a lot less frequently. Sure. Um, so for an infringement claim, you have to show that you own a valid trademark. Uh, so again, if you have a registration, um, often you're going to be good to go there. Um, or, but if you have a common law trademark, um, then you just have to show that the mark is distinctive, it's not functional, um, and, um, and it's otherwise valid. Um, and so, uh, so that's the first element. Uh, next, you have to show that the use of this mark is likely to cause confusion. Um, and um, when I teach uh, trademark law to my students, I actually sometimes will include additional elements because I say sometimes you might be representing the defendant. And you want to hammer on one of these other requirements. So, um, so the basic one would be you have to show you have a valid mark and there's a likelihood of confusion. But other elements that you see sometimes for infringement would be commercial use of the trademark being required in some jurisdictions. For example, the Ninth Circuit. And the Bosley medical case said that even though the word commercial use does not appear in the statute, the First Amendment requires us to interpret the statute in a speech protective manner. And so we, when we see the phrase use of the mark in connection with goods and services, we're going to say that that means commercial use of the trademark. Um, some scholars have argued that uh, a, a trademark use of the trademark is required for liability. In other words, you're using the trademark as a brand name or, or some other kind of source identifying trademark. Um, in your slogan or in your domain name. <clears throat> Other scholars disagree about this, uh, whether there's a requirement. Uh, Thomas McCarthy, uh, who, who writes the, one of the, the top treatises in this area, says that, that whether it's a use as a trademark is just part of the likelihood of confusion analysis. But um, you know, still, it's, it's something you want to consider, but it's not necessarily a requirement. Um, so, um, and obviously you need to be using the trademark in connection with goods and services. So, uh, you know, you might have a case where someone is just, uh, protesting a company, you know, with a sign out in front of their headquarters, right? They're not selling anything. They're not advertising anything. So, um, so that's probably uh, not going to be causing confusion, <coughs> but also not used in connection with goods and services. But, um, so that would be the infringement cause of action <coughs> for dilution. You don't have to show that the use is likely to cause confusion. You don't have to show your competitors, um, or you don't have to show any actual injury. Um, for infringement, if you if you don't have a registered mark, you do have to show that the use is likely to cause some sort of damage to the to the person claiming trademark rights. Uh, for the dilution claim, um, you just have to show you're likely to dilute. Um, the trademark, either by blurring, right? We talked about that mm-hmm. before. That's where you, you kind of harm the uniqueness of the mark or by tarnishment. And there's a multi-factor test for blurring as to whether <coughs> the um, 
the uh, trademark um, used by the defendant is blurring the uh, the famous trademark. Um, so for fame, for example, you have to show that the mark, um, you know, it has been pretty used for a pretty long time. You might look length of use, um, how much advertising you've done, you know, whether it's registered, you know, you might have a survey showing how many people have used it. But as long as you have a famous mark, you can sue for dilution. So that's one, one way it's kind of speech protective, the law, because it requires you to have a very, very strong mark. But it's less speech protective because it doesn't require the plaintiff to show the use is likely to cause confusion. Mm. Um, but what the legislators did was instead they enacted defenses that uh, what they claim, you know, were protecting free speech. So a non-commercial use of a trademark is not uh, is not uh, dilution under the law. Uh, use of the mark in news reporting, news commentary is also not dilution. And <clears throat> a descriptive uh, fair use or nominative fair use is also not dilution. So some people might say, look, free speech is protected enough in the dilution law because of this. But the problem is if you're using someone else's trademark and parody or satire and you're using it as a trademark, um, you're not going to be able to take advantage of these defenses. So an example is Chewy Vuitton, which was a parody of Louis Vuitton. It was Chewy Vuitton for dog toys. Um, and they were actually using that as a trademark. So they, they couldn't have a defense in that circumstance. Mm. <laughs> So, uh, so, th so I think that's that's one of the main differences. That's why dilution law might be problematic. Is, is even though it does regulate commercial speech, it does not regulate misleading commercial speech. Mm. And um, under First Amendment law, you can ban f fraudulent speech. You can ban misleading commercial speech. Um, but here, it's not misleading. So the Central Hudson Intermediate Scrutiny Test applies in that circumstance. And uh, critics of the dilution statute have said we don't think this would satisfy intermediate level scrutiny. And we actually think that this law is viewpoint discriminatory as well. So mm -hmm. let me know if you want me to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I, I thought this is what was interesting to me was like the way in which you sort of highlight the, the way in which dilution, the, the dilution cause of action seems to go in a much more direct way to the meaning of the mark itself it, like the kind of expressive meaning of the mark and not just its meaning in in sort of communicating source information to consumers. And, and I thought your discussion of inherently valuable expression in relation to this helpful for me in understanding sort of how this same sort of concern about social meaning and expressive meaning would play out across the the sort of trademark spectrum. Thank you. Well, so so uh, as you mentioned in the paper, I talk about uh, what's called in inherently valuable expression, right? Uh, words or symbols that had meaning before they were claimed as trademarks. Uh, so that would include descriptive terms, but also uh, culturally significant phrases um, like the name, you know, Dio de los Muertos, you know, Day of the Dead. Disney applied to register that as a trademark. Um, it would include uh, profanity, right? That, that has meaning before someone claims to use it as a trademark. Um, and, and and then popular slogans or phrases, right? Uh, all these all these uh, words, these rallying cries that people tried to register, you know, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, all those things could be um, <clears throat> are all inherently valuable expression. And so, what happens with the dilution statute is that um, when you have uh, this famous trademark, uh, you can prevent other uses of that word that are inconsistent with your message. And there was some language in Tam talking about the fact that 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 this law discriminated based on viewpoint because um, the government has to look at what the word means and then check if this particular trademark is inconsistent with what the government thinks is, is appropriate. And so in, in dilution law, um, if you have Victoria's Secret and you're using the term Victoria's Secret in a manner consistent with that source identifying message, right? You're making fun of Victoria's Secret. You're using it to identify Victoria's Secret. Um, <clears throat> as the target of your joke, or if you're using Victoria's Secret in comparative advertising, then then that's not actionable dilution. But if you're using, you know, Victor's Secret, right, to identify the name of your own business, and people aren't confused, no one thinks that there's any connection, <laughs> um, right? But but once you you see Victor's Secret, then maybe next time you see the word Victoria's Secret, you think about Victor's Secret, right? This is kind of the blurring harm. Um, and also the tarnishing harm, right? That you, maybe you then associate the sex toys with, with Victoria's Secret, even though, of course, they're also selling sex, but in a different way. 
Um, so, um, so, so that's it's it's this inconsistent message that you see with a blurring or tarnishing. Uh, uh, you know, name or mark um, that that is actionable, and so that's why in the paper I argue that dilution laws are not just content-based laws, but also laws that discriminate based on ideas. Um, you know, viewpoint. Maybe people could quibble about whether Victor's Secret conveys some sort of a viewpoint or these other kinds of phrases, right? Enjoy cocaine written in Coca-Cola script, right? Is that, is that a viewpoint? Maybe, maybe they're advocating drug use. Uh, but, um, but more to the point, right? These kinds of words are inconsistent with the brand owner's message. And that's why and we, and the, the argument, right, is that, well, the brand owners have spent a lot of money, um, in, in these marks, uh, in their brand message and, and, Congress has decided to protect that brand message. But uh, I think, and others think, uh, you know, Rebecca Tushnet, a few others that have been writing about this, um, that, that, that the very fact that it, it's trying to stop use of these inconsistent messages is what makes these laws um, uh, viewpoint discriminatory laws. And if, if that's really the court's position is once you discriminate based on, based on, based on viewpoint, you're done, then it's likely that dilution laws would also be found con unconstitutional. Although I think the argument's better for the tarnishment provision, right, which asks whether you're likely to harm the reputation of the trademark owner. And so usually in dilution cases, it's, it's cases involving drug use or, you know, sexual, sexual images, things like that. Uh, an example of drug use is someone tried to um, was creating these these uh, um, fake containers where you could stash money and it looked uh, like a Pepsi, I think, can or, or like a can of spam or some sort of company's product packaging. And really, there was nothing inside it. You just said you could put something inside it. And so because these kinds of of, uh, of devices are kind of associated with drug use, the, the court had that that said that that was uh, diluting the trademark of the company that complained about it. Um, so that's kind of what I tell my students is that is that the tarnishment provision regulates sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but maybe not the drugs, not the rock and roll part. But um, so I think that it's more likely that that tarnishment uh, will go down. Um, I think blurring would also go down uh, if somebody if the court looked at it. But um, but who knows? We'll see. There, there might be a difference here, right? Because of the fact that. Um, you know, some some cynics say that the court wants to protect, you know, the trademark owners, uh, right? But they're not going to protect the little guy who's trying to defend itself in a tarnishment or dilution, you know, or uh, dilution claim. But I, I disagree. I, I would hope the court would be consistent if this this issue did come up to them. Mm. So you, you've also written quite a bit about what you call, or I think generally known as non-traditional marks. I was just wondering if you could just really briefly say, because they're interesting and fun, a little bit of something about what that would be and, and whether you think that non-traditional marks implicate the same kinds of First Amendment, potentially implicate the same kinds of First Amendment question as, as other marks do. Sure. So non-traditional marks would include uh, basically um, things other than just words, names, and product packaging. So it would include sounds. Uh, an example of a recent registration would be uh, Zippo uh, lighters, the sound that they make when you open, ignite, and close them. That is now registered as a trademark. Um, scents can be, uh, fragrances can be registered as trademarks. And so uh, a recent example is uh, Hasbro has a registration for the scent of Play-Doh, um, which has kind of a combination of cherry and, and vanilla and other, other kinds of, I think it's an invented fragrance. Um, but it does have a little bit of that smell of salted wheat-based dough as part of it, but it's more than that. I actually did a, a scent test in my class, and the students were actually able to identify the Play-Doh scent. Um, I, you know, and, and, and when I showed them that, that's that toy modeling compound and other modeling compounds. Um, so it is distinctive. Uh, whether it's functioning as a trademark, you know, we can talk about that later. Um, textures can be protected as trademarks. So uh, a, the leather wrapping around the bottles is an example. I think a velvet texture for liquor has also been protected. Um, moving images, uh, Disney is claiming rights, I think, to the, the, um, the image of Mickey Mouse on, on Steamboat Willie in the Steamboat Willie film, uh, just some sh kind of a short version of the Steamboat Willie film. Uh, but you also see moving logos, things like that uh, in, in TV ads. Um, so all of these things are non-traditional trademarks. And um, so one might question whether this actually implicates the First Amendment, right? It, it might be anti-competitive to register um, what I call inherently valuable expression, right? Representational shapes or single colors. That's another example of a non-traditional mark. Um, 
But I, what I argued in a recent paper is that this does implicate the First Amendment for two reasons. Number one, um, if we're protecting a trademark, right, we're arguing that at that point that it actually has a source distinguishing meaning. Um, so right there, if you're banning someone's use of it, right, that's regulating expression. Um, but what I also argue is that a lot of times these product attributes might also have a non-source identifying message, right? So green might be associated with being environmentally friendly. Um, so Debbie Meyer green bags, right? Um, as an example, they actually have a registration for the word green bags, but also for the color green in connection with these bags used to keep your vegetables fresh. Um, another example I use is a skull design. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, the actor, and his buddy uh, sell, uh, designed this bottle in the shape of a skull that's similar to the crystal skulls in that movie, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Um, and uh, these were based on skulls found in the Yucatan. Um, and they actually sell vodka, crystal head vodka, in this skull-shaped bottle. And I found this great quote from Dan Aykroyd saying that a lot of times people buy this product for the, the the bottle, but we want them to crack the skull open, right? <laughs> um, and so in my article, I talk about the fact that, you know, skulls are often associated with Halloween, Day of the Dead, um, and, and uh, have this... In, you know, inherent meaning that in a sense, right, uh, anyone who tries to claim trademark rights in it would be free writing on that inherent meaning, that message, right, whether it's deemed to be ornamental, right, or decorative meaning, or maybe informational meaning, right, the green conveying environmentally friendly message. Um, when you apply to register a trademark, it might be rejected on the ground that it's merely informational matter or merely ornamental matter. Um, but the, there are definitely a number of marks that were still registered. And um, when uh, they are trying to stop others from using these product attributes, I argue that this could violate the free speech rights. So uh, in the case of the Crystal Head Vodka skull-shaped bottle, right, uh, they actually um, asked a UK couple who was selling bloody hell hot sauce in a skull-shaped bottle to stop using that skull sh shape for their bottle. Um, and they argued that it was violating their trademark rights. Now, they also own a copyright and a design patent in that skull shape. At some point, the copyright will expire. The patent will expire. But trademark rights can last forever. And so a number of scholars uh, uh, have argued that perhaps we shouldn't be granting trademark protection uh, to things that were formerly or currently protected by copyright law, right? Mickey Mouse, Steamboat Willie might be an example of that. Um, but uh, one of the things I've argued, right, is again, if, if it's one thing if you created it yourself, the value yourself, but again, if you're kind of free writing on something that's created before by another artist, um, you know, something that comes from nature, like a lion's roar, right? MGM owns rights to the lion's roar for its entertainment services. Perhaps we want to not register that, or if we do register it, we want to have narrow trademark protection, right? So you only get trademark rights for your goods and services for which you're either using the mark or for which you've registered it. Uh, because in both infringement and dilution law, you, your rights extend not just to your own goods and services, but if you can show either a likelihood of confusion about sponsorship or affiliation confusion, you know, that could be actionable. And then in dilution law, just that it's likely to harm the reputation or the distinctiveness of your mark, um, you could you can prevail. So, so that's one of the takeaways that I have here is that if it's inherently valuable, we don't um, allow you to have rights at all, or if we do give you rights, it should be very narrow. Mm -hmm. So, so Lisa, in in closing, it, it, I can't sh sh kind of help shake the feeling that it seems like maybe the court, the Supreme Court, didn't fully appreciate the can of worms that it was opening up when it conceptualized trademark registration and trademark law more generally. Uh, directly in relation to the First Amendment in Mittal v. v. Tam. Um, and I wonder, to what extent do you think it's going to sort of let those potential consequences kind of play out to their end game, Or do you think there's a possibility it might kind of lose its nerve, as it were, and try to weasel out of some of these consequences? That's an interesting question, right? So, um, you know, I, I would hope that they would apply First Amendment scrutiny to these trademark laws, just like they did to the registration provisions we've been talking about. Um, in the copyright law area, the court did say, uh, with regard to enforcement of copyright, that copyright laws are not immune from the First Amendment scrutiny, but they're not subject to heightened scrutiny, even though they do regulate speech based on its content. So that's one question is, will the court decide that trademark laws are this different 
type of category of speech um, th where we just have a different rule for them, right? We don't try to fit it into one of these other boxes that it's a limited public forum, right? Or government subsidy or, if, you know, is it commercial speech or non-commercial speech and therefore traditional tests apply. Um, so I think there's a possibility, and I think this op it opens up uh, an opportunity for, for commentators, right, to come up with a test they could adopt if they decide not to apply traditional First Amendment scrutiny. Um, but what I think is important about uh, First Amendment analysis is it really forces us to think about why are we regulating trademarks and is this law actually furthering that goal, right? So um, we have to identify what's the government interest, right? Is it compelling? Is it substantial, right? Is this law directly furthering that government interest? Just because trademarks, for example, promote competition generally doesn't mean that this particular trademark law does that. Um, and if, if we require these laws to be narrowly tailored, right, if we require them not to harm expression too much, um, I think overall the goals of trademark law will be furthered um, and hopefully, you know, the public and co competition will be better off. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program, Lisa. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and I learned a ton about trademark law today. Well, thank you for having me. Mm. 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 Mm.